people are beginning to ask questions about who you want to be, what you want to do with your life, who you want to date, how you want to look. Just questions about identity and yourself. What I can offer today is just a little bit of insight from uh, the viewpoint of psychoanalytic theory into why those questions can be can get a bit confused and muddled and more difficult to answer. So first some words of context. Um, I the first thing I think I hit upon was like that this was about becoming yourself and becoming your most authentic self. And so straight off I was like that is a big ass concept. Um, so you know no rush, there's no deadline and certainly not as this was sort of um, sort of catering for 18 to 24 year old people, it's like definitely like you're perhaps only just getting started, or if you're not even asking those questions, that's totally fine. It's a lifelong thing, and we just continue to get challenged and grow from those things, so no rush. The other thing was, if you are starting to ask those questions, again, they are big and they have follow up questions, and that might raise the language. So, a bit of language is totally normal. Uh, but if it's real despair, then that's a totally legitimate reason to ask for help and to talk to somebody else and just to say that. And then finally, was just patience. Be patient. Um, it's a good life lesson. And yeah, again, like, these are big questions, so give yourself the time to come around to answers for them. Um, yeah, so now to the theory stuff. Uh, the mirror phase. This is a psychoanalytic concept that basically humans go through a really unique process in that we actually go from being this, these completely reliant infants who cannot do anything for ourselves and we have to cross this path where we are self-questioning, um, self-conscious, self-doubting and, and how we do that and how we, we initially come to this concept of ourselves. And psychoanalysts like, well, believe we can see it starting in the recognition of oneself in the mirror. And um, that this process, this is what starts this concept of I, and I as separate from my many hairs, all of that stuff. So if you've ever picked up a baby and walked them over to a mirror uh, and gone, is that, is that Anna, <coughs> or whatever, you are also, while it seems like nothing is happening, you are actually participating in that kid, you know, rec beginning to recognise that they are Anna, a separate person, or whatever, whoever they are. Um, and as we get more socialised around this time as well, um, we're becoming separate individuals, but we're becoming part of the family, or part of an extended family, or part of a play school group, primary school group. So this is. This talk covers a like, big swath of, of time for little kids, um, but a big part that comes in next is mimicry and mirroring. And this is how we enter into language. We're encouraged to like, repeat, mama, dada, whatever it is. But we learn how to act from the people around us, and we're really social creatures like that. Um, so this is where we learn, <coughs> and this is, you know, debates, there are different theories about this, but it's where we learn gender certainly a performativity of a certain aspect of gender. It's where we learn normal. And as you grow up, particularly around primary school age, there's a certain time where the idea of normal becomes really, really important, uh, fitting in, not being left out, and um, that's where comparison comes in a lot more. That um, little kids, uh, well, you know, comparison is, you know, just here, it's something, it's, oh, sorry, that's the next slide, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, that's the part that, it's a really key part of social development, but it's, it's also part that probably we still remember most, like we don't remember being held up to the mirror, we don't remember mirroring other people, but we still think from that position of, does that reflect me, or that doesn't reflect me? Um, and where that takes us in the wider world, like I would say we start out, it's it's our neighbourhoods, our primary schools, or it's our town. It then goes, in particular with social media, but like, you know, depictions of, of women in general, or depictions of men in general, but that they can be so limited. They can be 
just so boring, essentially. And unfortunately for women, there's a tyranny of those those images and pictures. <coughs> They're just based on desirability and beauty and really just one-sided and not very complicated. And being the social creatures that we are, we look to the outside to find reflections in ourselves. So in terms of all these images and depictions, um, I would say, check. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, so the really important thing about comparison is that it is the thief of joy. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, as I say, it's limiting. It's, it's not very handy to look for yourself necessarily in, in other people. So in relation, if you're looking at what's possible, there are two things to maybe figure out how to put into practice for yourself, or just practice for yourself. One is like that is that person, and I am separate, and I do not owe it to anybody to live up to that person, or to be that kind of person. <coughs> the second is to be the change you want to see, because we all need to have this really, um, as I was driving in the car, I was sort of like thinking of this, the sort of ideas of, of the limitations, and the thing that popped into mind was like, you don't see like say an asexual rocket scientist who's a total makeup junkie <laughs> and both men and women are the lesser for it I think. <laughs> you just don't see a wide swath of like identities around the place and it's limiting for both men and women to think in those confined terms so in terms of finding the authenticity um, sorry. um in terms of no, looking for the uh, Authenticity, I would recommend, well, just in a general way, like unplugging from social media in a way, uh, finding other places to find ideas about identity or other ideas about who to be or how to be, um, and playing with ideas of gender and normality and taking on challenges, shaking life up, just testing what you're capable of, of doing and being. Um, and those things, yeah, it's like, you know, if you exercise, you feel stronger in your body and what your body is capable of. And if you test yourself and challenge yourself in terms of your brain and your perception and thinking, then you're going to feel a lot more confident and capable of, you know, whatever, whatever challenge you want to do, you're going to feel that bit more able to do it. Um, and lastly, but there was, like, yes, the most, um, important relationship in life is with yourself. Obviously, you'll be with yourself to the end. Um, but, um, the other thing was, I do think that this idea of chasing pleasures, or just going after pleasure, that that is some idea, or even like chasing a particular body type or a way of looking, <coughs> that there's some idea that happiness or contentment is connected with that. And personally, I don't necessarily believe that. I think it's more internal that if you challenge yourself and what you're capable of doing and being of use in the world and being around other people, so that's where you feel more contentment. So, yeah. That's, that's mm -hmm.